for you. That is my official title, by the way, the most excellent Peter Morris. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, we've learned quite a few things so far, including that when Ed says swipe right, a surprising proportion of you know what that means. Uh, just while we're setting up the stage and the microphones, etc., for our next guys, our broadcast guys, uh, let's consider just for a minute a headline. Imagine you're looking at your social media first thing in the morning because you're that sad, and a headline pops up. It's man fights for life after crash. It grabs your attention. It, it, it's got rhythm and rhyme. It jumps out. Fight. It's a, great, it's, it's a great active verb. That's the sort of thing you want. It gets your attention. It's exciting. Uh, now let's imagine that there's live TV coverage of the man fighting for life. It's sort of... That's about all you do. Bit of dribble like that. A half-hour program of the man just going like that. And after about two minutes, you're going to think, this is a bit crap, really, isn't it? Uh, because even though it's really important, you know the guy is on the edge of death, this is an important story. Somewhere else in the digisphere, right now, there is a fast-moving kitten that doesn't know that a glass door is being closed <laughs> and which is more important to watch. Some stories work for some media, some not for others. So if you're getting into a tie-up with broadcast media, you've got to know those animals. And lucky for you, we've got three denizens of television, three blokes from the telly, a swipe right before you've even started there. Uh, first up, we're going to introduce... Now, he's billed as being from BBC Radio 4, but anyone who's from a radio station actually does much, much more work than that and works for many, many things. He's a very experienced gentleman. Please welcome to the stage, uh, Dimitri Hutart. Enters from the right. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'll be talking for uh, just under 10 minutes, I think, and we've got uh, another couple of guests. Is, is that the plan? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so we'll do questions at the end after all three. Um, uh, um, and I want to put a disclaimer at the beginning. Uh, we've been asked to be provocative, so uh, I'll try not to offend everybody, but uh, I'll try to stick to the brief at the same time. Um, and I was interested to, to read uh, the program in the program in this top of the session, uh, this session in your program today. Um, it says that uh, for you reaching a broad audience with important environmental messages uh, can be a frustrating business. Um, the good news for you is that being on the other side can also be a frustrating business. So you're not the only one. Um, we share that together. Um, and one of the main channels of communication that there is between your organization and ourselves as journalists is, um, is through press releases. So I, I want to talk a little bit about press releases. And, and I'm sure all of you press, press releases from your organization are fantastic. But just in case, I will focus on some of the less fantastic ones, which obviously is not, not yours. Um, because I sometimes, like you, get frustrated um, when I end up losing my time, uh, you know, spending one minute trying to understand what the story you're trying to sell me uh, through a press release. Um, and I, I get frustrated because uh, this can be uh, a minute of my life which I will never get back, and potentially a minute of my life which I could have spent with my children at the end of the day. So if you're trying to sell me a story, if you start by frustrating me, it's not the best relationship. So don't frustrate me. Um, I would say, on average, I probably get between 20 and 50, 60 press releases every day. They get buried in my inbox between the 100, 150 work emails I get every day. My work emails are quite important. Um, if I don't read them and act on it, uh, on them, I'll probably end up losing my job. So when I get to you uh, press releases, um, I, I've, I'm, I don't have much time. I would say, on average, I do the initial scanning of the top line and scan read, scan read your uh, opening paragraph in one second. So you've got one second to grab my attention. Uh, and as I say, so, you, so the, the top line, the top title of your press release uh, has got to tell me what your story is about uh, and then develop in your opening paragraph very much like we do in press. Um, but so, yeah, you've got around one second to grab my attention. Within that one second, I will delete around 80% of those press releases just so you know. So, um, uh, <laughs> um, but because I'm, I'm nice and caring, I'd like to share uh, some of my frustration with you. Uh, so here is a press release that was sent to me last week. Uh, the title reads, Abandon all travel. Don't go outside. It's full of storms, floods, and heat waves. But don't panic. 
that tells me absolutely nothing about what the story is about. Um, but obviously, the opening paragraph is going to be very clear and tell me everything I need to know. So here it is. Uh, and it reads, first they repeat their really good title, Abandon All Travel, Don't Go Outside, It's Full of Storms, Floods and Heat Waves, But Don't Panic. Then here it goes. There is no calm before the storm as hashtag snowmageddon and hashtag frankenstorm hit. Since the turn of the millennium, large-scale weather disasters have been seemingly more common and more commonly reported by the media as special events. Media reaction to extreme weather has therefore shaped how communities react to it, has exasperated the potential for mass panic and has driven public responses to aid, they forgot a coma, as the media cultivates the condition of permanent crisis. I still have no idea what the story is about. <laughs> And no, I have lost 10 seconds of my life, which I will never get back, which I could have spent with my children. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just going to go through a, a, a other small things that uh, sometimes frustrate me. Um, attachment, um, press release, I, I get them every day. Um, dear Dimitri, uh, here's uh, um, uh, a pr our latest press release. Uh, attach which will be of interest to you. I'm afraid I will never know if it's of interest to me because I won't take time to open the attachment. If you want to send that attachment, very well, but make sure the body of the press release is in the email as well. I don't have time to open it. Um, yesterday's news, we get quite a lot of press release about the fantastic event that happened yesterday. No news program wants to be about yesterday's news. We're about tomorrow's news. So uh, don't send it after the event. Uh, sounds probably obvious to all of you, but it's surprising the number of... Uh, press release we've got about yesterday's news. Um, oh, that's another really irritating one. Um, we, we, we receive a press release and we're really excited about your story uh, and we really want to, to, to act on it. Uh, you've just, your organization has just uh, come up with some really interesting new research. Uh, the embargo is tomorrow morning. You send it in time, excellent. My team called call the, the number at the bottom of the press release just to be told that Actually, everybody involved with that research is at, at the moment in, on holiday in Tasmania, but we can't talk to them in three weeks' time. If you're going to issue some big research, which is really interesting, has got potential to interest my teams, make sure somebody can talk about it. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a bit limiting for us. I mean, you know, we, we can't just read your press release on there. Um, and, and I guess... Um, that goes back to knowing your audience, very much like us as broadcasters or journalists. You know, we would, uh, the, the same story would be covered in very different ways if, if it's on Radio 4 or the News at 6 or Today programme or online. Um, you know, it, it, you know one, one way for organisation to create an impact and be in being the news is, is stunt, and those are done all the time. But different stunt will have different effect for, or, or, or different attractions for different media. So if you get a D-list celebrity opening your new farm shop, this may be of high interest to the local paper, but don't, don't ask your work experience to give me a call to see if we received a press release about last year runner-up from The Apprentice opening your farm shop, because you know, for a network news program, it's not really of interest. So you've wasted your uh, work experience time, but more importantly, you've wasted another two minutes of my time, which I could have spent with my children. Um, so, um, uh, oh, oh, the other one uh, uh, I've got uh, an issue with is um, surveys and polls, um, uh, often used by organisations to try to create headlines uh, and to, cry, to, to, to get people uh, uh, to create an interest in their story. Um, I'm extremely sceptical of most surveys and polls. Uh, if they're not done by one of the top independent uh, poll companies, uh, um, I probably will highly discourage my team to mention it or to use them. Uh, uh, because they, they're normally uh, not worth that much. I mean, I know they probably carry the message you want to carry, but that's my problem with it. Uh, you know, if the Wild Bear Society uh, who campaigned for rewilding and campaigning for uh, the reintroduction of wild bear in Scotland uh, have done a poll saying that 85% uh, of the people polled are, in, uh, are supporting the reintroduction of wild bear in Scotland, if you start to dig down and the poll was done online on the website where, by definition, only people who are interested in wild bear in Scotland will log in, uh, it doesn't mean anything. Actually, my question would be, how come it's not 99%? Because I would assume everybody will go to your website interested. So, you know, 
trying to sell me polls about amazing uh, thing, except if they've done really independently and properly. I mean, I've commissioned Paul, and I've worked with Maury and those people, or, or YouGov. And, you know, if you work with them, you know how difficult it is to get the question right, to make sure you don't influence. Um, online polls are normally very dubious. I don't really use them. I don't trust them. Um, but saying all that, uh, I do want to hear from you. Um, you know, and I've worked with some of you, uh, 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 and we've done some fantastic work and uh, um, with, with some of you. So, um, uh, and I would say, if you, especially if you've got a story of, of genuine news interest, you know, do get in touch with me in plenty of time, uh, well before the embargo, so we can potentially plan it across the, the network. Uh, recently, you know, uh, because I, I also have a job of the, the rural affair champion for the whole of the BBC, uh, I sometimes send stories right across. So uh, just last month, uh, you know, with a story which we've planned for a very long time, uh, we've produced it for Network TV News, for Today Program, for Farming Today, for Online. So I, I do want to, to hear from you with genuine good news story and well-written press releases. Um, and, and also... Um, I know that sometimes there is pressure, especially on the uh, communication department, to have an article in a big national newspaper or, or to be on the Today program. Um, I would say don't dismiss farming today. Um, you would think I would say that, but uh, I will come with uh, objective numbers for you. Um, farming Today First is not a niche program. I'd like to make it very clear. Farming Today is not for farmers. Farming Today is for any Radio 4 listeners. Um, just our Saturday program uh, uh, reached 950,000 listeners, so 950,000 people listened to our Saturday program. Uh, that's far more than any Newsnight program, by the way, so more people listen to our Saturday program than ever watch Newsnight. Um, that is also more than the combined circulation of the Times, the I, the Guardian, and the Independent put together. So, you know, and, and, you know, most of Westminster wake up to farming today. So, um, so do think about us. So uh, that, that's me. But, uh, you know, you, you do a fantastic job as well. And uh, I know I've been slightly provocative, but uh, it's just so we can work better together at the end. So thank you very much. Clap him twice. He came on. He clapped him once, and he had a go at you. <laughs> uh, next up, uh, we've got from BBC Wildlife magazine, nay, BBC Wildlife multimedia platform. It's only the editor, Mr. Ben Hoare. Actually, just gave me a promotion there, man. The uh, features editor. Um, I'm rather disappointed we don't have the stools. I thought we were going to be like a boy band. But, um, I think sometimes it feels like the world is going to hell in a handcart. Like Chris Packham said that in his column. And um, yet it's an incredibly exciting time for environmental journalism. I think both on our side and on your side. And uh, it, may, it, may be, uh, it may seem rather a cynical thing to say, but I think those two things go together. So yes, the stakes for conservation have never been higher. But that also, mean the story, that also means that the stories have never been more important. And um, our readers are very engaged, so it's a self-selecting audience. You, if you buy BBC Wildlife, you're clearly going to be interested in the subject. And we've got a phenomenally committed readership. They always tell us they want to change the world. Um, so very briefly, I should probably give a little bit of background um, about the magazine. And incidentally, I think it's worth... Um, most magazines have got lots of reader research, which is mostly aimed at advertisers. But if you're pitching stories and press releases to magazines, it's worth getting into the mindset of who the readers are, because very distinctive readerships. Um, so like all other BBC-branded magazines, um, we're published by Immediate Media. So I'm not a BBC employee. Uh, BBC Worldwide has spun off pretty much all its BBC magazines now and immediate media publishes the lion's share of them. Um, so we're commercial, we turn a profit, um, but in, incidentally we sign up to exactly the same editorial guidelines as the Today programme, Newsnight, um, 10 o'clock news. So I go on all the same training as Dimitri and everyone else, and it's very tiresome. And if you don't like what Chris Packham says, you can complain to the BBC Trust, and some people do. 
Um, we're quite an unusual magazine uh, in that we don't really have any newsstand competitors. Um, uh, another unusual thing is that our readership is split very evenly between the sexes. So we're 51% um, women, 49% men. Quite unusual. Most glossy mags are uh, pretty much aimed more at women or men. It's quite unusual to be um, that balanced. Uh, we've got a lot of readers who are over 40, a substantial minority who are at uni. Um, and we're one of the oldest BBC magazines. We're actually old. We're with over 50. Uh, only the Radio Times is older than us. Um, and that's, for, for a long time, BBC Wildlife was basically the journal of record. You know, there was no competition in a pre-digital era. Uh, we were where you, you came to if you wanted environmental news. Obviously, that's all changed. And I think James, who's on next, used to work at BBC Wildlife, I think, probably just as that period was coming to an end in the late 90s. And nowadays, of course, that's all changed, and we're in this kind of um, highly fractured media landscape where you've got a growing number of people aren't even getting their news from um, news websites. Uh, growing numbers of people are getting them from their news from this kind of um, non-stop, always-on, endless torrent of information through Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And um, that means that it's very, it's, it's, there's a lot of noise, it's very difficult to be heard, uh, it's difficult for us as well as for you. So distinctiveness and quirkiness is one of the key things we're after, basically. Um, there's a lot of greenwash and hogwash. So if I get 100 press releases in a week, I would say um, at least 20 will be pretty flimsy. Um, another 20 is just any disguised marketing puff I can look at in a fraction of a second. Um, another 20 won't be relevant to our readers because nobody took the trouble to learn about the magazine. Um, so what do we look for in a press release? Well, Dimitri's mentioned quite a few things already. I think substance, novelty, passion, quirky details, anecdotes is, is quite an engagement. Um, bland quotes are a turn-off. What we really like is um, engaging people we can talk to and get good quotes from. And uh, it's nice to know that they're available because that rather than, re we, we would never recycle the text of a press release. We want to go to the person mentioned in the press release to make it our own story. And obviously one of the difficulties that we have is that we're a long lead title. So very different from Dimitri. Our long lead is two months plus. So um, if you have a media plan, it's very useful to have. Um, some NGOs are better than others at telling us that in 2016 this is what they're doing. But if, if you're doing something with Dormice in 2016, now's the time to tell us, really. Um, and that kind of planning can make the difference between a, a full-length feature, like um, WWT Spoonbill Sandpipers, I think that was two or three years ago, or just a 30-word news in brief, because we simply we, we can't respond um, as quickly as radio and TV. Um, so because we're long lead, we can't be the first story, but we aim to be the best. So what we try and do is add context. We're looking to give a slightly different take on things. So um, we're looking for things where we can add a bit of extra analysis. So if you're crafting a press release and you think that there's something that we could do differently from the mainstream media, then that's going to be very attractive to us. So um, Cecil the Lion hogged, hogged the headlines, but we did a much more nuanced look at that. We went to Craig Packer, and he's actually pro-hunting uh, in some respects in South Africa, which is not what you got from the, most of the reporting in a few days afterwards. Uh, there was another story about the um, Regent's Park hedgehogs. Uh, it's good clickbait. It was picked up by most of the media. Um, uh, Regent's Park hedgehogs had suddenly learned to avoid traffic. But unfortunately, it wasn't quite as simple as that. And the research hadn't, you know, we, we, we came to that story and were able to give a bit of a more balanced look. Unfortunately, it's not quite such a good news story. Um, some types of story, as Dimitri said, are definitely overused. Polls is one citizen science surveys, uh, getting kids into nature, uh, reintroducing or translocating animals. Um, I've got another one here. Um, tagging animals. I mean, these, these, we're as guilty as anyone else. We use all these stories, but it can seem a little bit samey. And because we are a long lead title, we, by necessity, we have to try and look for things that are a little bit quirky. And what I think sometimes people don't realize is that in their organization, they've often got amazing people who possibly aren't um, very good 
at speaking up within the organisation and making themselves heard. But they're, to me, they're often the most interesting people. And I'm always amazed that sometimes I, um, I might be talking to a press officer and they mention, oh, you know, oh yeah, there is Lizzie. I talked to Lizzie and Lizzie's amazing. And um, something to bear in mind, I think. Um, and the other thing is, don't, don't be despondent if a press release doesn't get picked up already, because we do file them away, little nuggets of information. I'm a bit of a magpie storing things away. Okay. Thank you very much. You clapped him as well. Sit, sit in silent judgment. <laughs> uh, I've got lots of questions uh, to come up. Do not be bullied by these guys. You'll note that sometimes I stand there, sometimes I stand here. The guy there has to ride the feedback on the levels of my mic. The cameras have to move about. Make them work as well. Uh, our third broadcast person to come up is um, from a, a production company. In the 80s when I started, production companies were there for people who wanted to get into real telly. Now the big budgets for big documentaries, etc., are with the production companies. So all the rest of that. From Plimpsoul Productions, who have made plenty of stuff that you have seen, please welcome James Smith. Um, I thought I'd start with a, a question. I work in the mainstream TV industry, um, making programmes for BBC, ITV, um, Discovery, Nat Geo. And I just wanted to ask you, when was... Well, in the past month, well, let's say October... Who watched a documentary about conservation or environmental issues on a mainstream broadcast? And I mean terrestrial broadcasters, BBC One, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5. Put your hands up if you saw one. Okay, so what was that in the front row? What was that film? Patagonia. Would you say that was an environmental conservation? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it, I would, but I'm biased. But did it, I mean, it didn't really deal, sorry, it, I picked you out, but it didn't really deal with <laughs> conservation issues. I'm talking about a film that, that took on the conservation problems facing the world head on, looked at issues, looked at solving those issues. Who saw a film in the last in October that dealt with that? Okay, one. What was that? Uh, Racing Extinction. Racing Extinction, but it wasn't on a mainstream channel, wasn't it? Which is a good point. That's a feature documentary which is in cinemas or on Netflix or something. Um, I don't think I, I look for these programs. I try and make these programs. I have done for 17 years. I think the interesting thing about uh, the broadcast media now is that there is a paucity of, of wildlife documentaries on our channels, particularly in the UK. And um, I'm a child of the 80s. I was educated in the 1980s, and I was brought up on seminal series such as um, Decade of Destruction, which was a five-part series looking at the destruction of the Amazon, and it kind of prompted Sting to get on, you know, um, his campaign. And and as a as a kind of uh, young man, that really did affect me. So I believe in the power of television to change. I believe in the power of television to make people aware. And if it wasn't for those series that I watched, I probably wouldn't be doing the job that I'm doing now. But I find myself in a broadcast landscape where there is very, very little on our channels, and it's extraordinarily hard to get those films commissioned. Um, I, I, don't, I don't exactly know why. I think a lot of programs in the 80s um, built up to the Rio summit in 1992. Um, and there was a lot of, lot of media and a lot of noise around that, that particular Earth summit. And after that moment, I think the general perception was that the, the public were inured to environmental issues on television, that they had uh, been desensitised, and it became increasingly hard to get those films made. Um, and you know, for 17 years, I have on and off tried to get those films made, but I've, tried, I've done it by kind of sleight of hand. So I worked on a film about climate change in 1998, but we didn't really take it on head on. What we did was look at how wildlife was uh, responding to climate change. So it was actually a very beautiful film which went to the Maldives and the, uh, the Arctic uh, region, et cetera, et cetera. But it was lots of natural history and it, it kind of got the issue in through the back door and it did very well and people watched it. So I do, I do believe that people will watch these things, but it was a, a beautiful film. Um, I then worked with Bruce Parry on a number of series and we made one about the Amazon, which was essentially about Amazonian deforestation. But we drew the audience in because Bruce inevitably would get naked and take loads of drugs and dance around and all that kind of stuff. And so it got a mainstream audience in, but then we talked about deforestation and other, other um, threats to the, to the rainforest. And we did the same with Arctic, with the Arctic. He went around the Arctic Circle. The subtext was always climate change to all those films, but again, he you know, killed a seal and squeezed an eyeball into his mouth and did all that kind of stuff, which, which drew in you know, an audience that may not have watched those, those environmental shows. Um, what I've kind of noticed, I suppose, is, you know, in the last kind of 20 years, that it's no longer, an issue, you know, if an issue is important, that is no longer enough to get it on television in the broadcast media sense. It may be on news and it may be on, 
you know, you know, El Nino, currently we're going through El Nino. I'm sure we're going to see lots more about that. There was, you know, the, the, the drought in, in Ethiopia is actually an El Nino story. People haven't been reporting it as such, but I think they will start to, to talk about the El Nino, the current El Nino, because it's going to be one of the, or potentially one of the biggest for 30 years. But um, it's very, very hard to get those films away in documentaries. Um, at the moment, you know, I used to work for the BBC for the Natural History Unit. I now work for Plimsoll Productions, and so we're constantly pitching these ideas. And, and in fact, the other day, I was with a BBC commissioner, and we pitched an environmental series. And what he said was, he said, it's too worthy. He said, we're not going to do that. It's too worthy. And I think that's a phrase that it's worth bearing in mind. He said, we well, you know, we could do something, but I'd want it to be more definitive. Or this, or that. But that was the adjective that he used, worthy. And I think that's the kind of the note I want to finish with. I don't want to be too depressing, really. But I think it's worth us being aware of that, that worthy doesn't sell. If it's perceived to be worthy, people, particularly mainstream broadcasters, don't want to go near it. They want it to be edgy. They want it to be headline grabbing. They want it to be entertaining. They want it to be beautiful. They want it to be all these other things. But worthy, they do not want. And so that's something that I constantly kind of come up against in my day to day. And I think it's something as, as kind of communicators and people working in the environment and conservation, conservation sector we need to be aware of, that it's a turn off um, for many people. Thanks very much, James. <laughs>